Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Wednesday, February 23rd. And tonight we're talking about strategy for Ukraine and Russia. The Pentagon says Russia is ready to attack at any moment. That's after much of the Western world imposed sanctions on that country. We'll consider how much sanctions even matter to Russia, especially since it endured them before. And former Ambassador Michael McFaul is with us. Turns out he is on Vladimir Putin's sanctions list. Then Ukraine is already under attack in cyberspace. What dangers could a cyber war pose? The Department of Homeland Security says the threat is real. We'll explain. Then the CDC is ready to issue guidance for the next phase of the pandemic. Also, a new COVID vaccine is up for FDA approval. And paying rent is getting harder for more Americans. We'll share some of your stories about trying to keep a roof over your head. Tonight, Ukraine is preparing for war. The Pentagon says Russian troops are in position and they're ready to attack. Russian forces uh, continue to uh, assemble uh, closer to the border um, and, uh, and put themselves in uh, uh, an advanced stage of readiness to, to act. They are, they are ready. I, I'll just put it, leave it at that. They're, they're ready. Russia has nearly 200,000 troops mobilized on Ukraine's border. A senior defense official tells NBC News that 80% of them, 80%, are ready for a full-scale assault. The UN Security Council will be holding an emergency meeting tonight, basically a half hour after we go off the air this evening, to address this situation. Again, that meeting is tonight. Earlier today in Kyiv, Russia began evacuating its embassy there. According to the Associated Press, the Russian flag is no longer flying over that building. Meanwhile, President Biden has announced a new set of sanctions. They target the Nord Stream 2 fuel pipeline and its corporate offices. Nord Stream 2 is an $11 billion Russian-owned project. As you can see from this map, it connects Russia to Germany. But yesterday, Germany also imposed sanctions on the pipeline, stopping its certification entirely. If it ever comes online, it could generate as much as $15 billion in revenue for Russia. The U.S. is also sanctioning two Russian financial institutions and imposing penalties on Russia's sovereign debt. The idea is to cut Russia off from Western financing. So the West is hoping to hit Vladimir Putin economically and make this invasion literally unaffordable. But the U.S. sanctioned Russia before, the last time it invaded Ukraine. And here we are. So will this time be any different? Let's begin tonight with CNBC wealth reporter Robert Frank. Well, you could call it Russia's financial shield. After the 2014 sanctions, Russia quietly started building a new financial system that relies less on the dollar and U.S. treasuries and more on the euro and gold. Russia's foreign currency reserves now totaling over $630 billion. That is enough to cover two years of imports or pay off Russia's entire external debt. It can also support Russian companies, banks and oligarchs for several months, even during the toughest of economic sanctions. Now, if you add to that a debt to GDP ratio of less than 18 percent, that's one of the best in the world. They also have a current account surplus and you have oil closing in on $100 a barrel. Add that all together. Russian officials saying these sanctions and perhaps others will be, quote, unpleasant, but fundamentally change nothing. Now, the 2014 sanctions imposed by the U.S. are now regarded as a policy failure since the Russians simply found new channels in the global financial system for their hard currency and their debt. Foreign investors used to own more than half of Russia's bonds. Now, it's less than 20 percent. The White House says these sanctions are tougher since they're coordinated with Europe. But Russia is far more prepared this time around. In December alone, Russia imported nearly $5 billion in additional hard currency. Add to that whatever potential crypto they hold. And Russia has a lot of financial assets to weather the storm. Robert Frank. CNBC Business News. All right. Thank you, Robert, very much. Ukrainian leaders have spent months expressing calm in the face of a possible war. 
These days, they're also expressing more urgency. Here's Ukraine's foreign minister addressing the UN General Assembly. I warn every nation in this distinguished chamber, no one will be able to sit out this crisis if President Putin decides that he can move forward with his aggression against Ukraine. The beginning of a large-scale war in Ukraine will be the end of the world order as we know it. Ukraine has declared a 30-day state of emergency. It is telling millions of its citizens who live in Russia to leave there. Ukraine is also calling up military reservists for up to a year of service. The call affects reservists as old as 60. This enlistment office in Kyiv had people lined up to register. Let's continue now with NBC foreign correspondent Cal Perry. He is in Lviv in northwestern Ukraine, and that is near the border with Poland. Cal, tell us what the mood is like on the ground there right now. You know, it was a fascinating day, Joshua, for the reasons that you sort of laid out and previewed. You have a change of tone now from the Ukrainian government. We've heard mostly from Washington in the past few weeks about the danger and the crisis and the building up of the military. And it's been the Ukrainian president who's been trying to play it fairly low key. And it's understandable why. You don't want to have a run on the banks. You don't want to have people fleeing. And you're holding out hope the entire time that maybe this invasion won't happen. Today, a very different story. We have this emergency law that went into effect about three hours ago, which we could see eventually checkpoints, for example, in the capital, checking people's IDs, checking in trunks of cars, things that you typically see in war zones as that threat level is raised. We had an address from the Ukrainian president about an hour ago, and he gave it almost entirely in Russian, and he posted it on Telegram, which is a clear indication that he wanted to reach directly to the Russian people. And he said to the Russian people, we want peace in Ukraine. We don't want this war. There's not much that really divides us. It was a clear plea directly to the people of Russia to avoid a wide-scale invasion. So this change of tone, I think when you couple it with the cyber attacks, when you couple it with the shelling that we've seen in the East, certainly has raised the tension. I think a lot of people here in Ukraine are starting to believe what Washington has been saying, Joshua. Cal, what's the strategy there in terms of uh, pres the president um, of Ukraine speaking directly to the Russian people in Russian? This is all obviously in Vladimir Putin's hands. Is he hoping to delegitimize Putin if he goes forward with his invasion? Like, what's the strategy there? You know, the address, I, it really was a rebuttal to what Russian state TV is putting out. So at one point, um, the Ukrainian president said, we are not Nazis. Right. That's something that state television has been saying about Ukrainians and has been playing up the danger. Um, state television in, in Russia has been saying to the Russian people, you know, Ukraine uh, is is a danger as an offensive um, strategy that they could basically attack us. The president saying that's not true. The things that you're hearing are not true. And again, putting it on Telegram, not doing a broadcast on television, clearly trying to reach the Russian people, but a very clear rebuttal to that propaganda that state TV um, has been putting out, Joshua. We saw that video of Ukrainians enlisting in Kyiv. Talk about what's going on there in terms of preparing for the possibility, possibly the likelihood, that diplomacy might fail. Yeah, and, and where I am, as you sort of laid out, I'm closer to Poland than I am even um, to the capital in Kiev. Um, and so what you have where I am is really two things happening. You, you have a bolstering of nationalistic support, right, for um, anyone who is going to fight at least, you know, in the start, what would be that sort of eastern front. Um, so supply drives, the local papers covering that. The second thing happening in this city is this is a fallback plan for everybody, including foreign diplomats who would normally be in Kiev. So the foreign missions have moved here as well. The thinking when you look at the map and you know where these NATO troops are, are just, you know, 90 kilometers away in Poland. The thinking as you look at the big map is if Putin does some kind of invasion, it probably won't happen this far west. And so people are already kind of pre-positioning themselves um, out of fear. And that fear, I think, is really only growing, especially when, again, you know, Washington laid out this is how it could go, A, B, and C. And now we're seeing A, B, and C. And we're hearing sort of the continuation of this story that we've already been told by Washington. Yeah, just to kind of clarify a little bit more of what Cal is referring to, just for the geography of all of this, we should note that Russian forces are along uh, the northern and eastern. The, you know, they can approach from three sides of Ukraine right now. Poland shares an east-west border with Ukraine, so the west would be Poland, and that's why a number of people have moved toward Lviv, which is where Cal is right now. As you can see, they're on the map. You see Russian forces north at Belarus, along the eastern border, and then further south, that little brown piece at the bottom is Crimea, so that's where Russian forces are. 
To the west is Poland, and that's closer to where Cal is. With regards to the state of emergency, with regards to all the enlistments, we've spoken to other folks on the ground, Cal, who say life is also kind of going on. It's not like Kiev has just shut down and gone into complete war preparations mode. How much are people able to, like, balance daily life alongside the threat from Russia? Well, and that's, and that's sort of the amazing thing um, in any conflict, is that the majority of the people who live in these countries are trying to get on with their lives. They're, they're not trying to be caught up in some geopolitical game. They're just trying to put their kids through school and feed their families and get on with life. It's all the more difficult, of course, when you have cyber attacks um, hitting banks. I mean, that's the kind of thing that can really destabilize a country without an invasion. If, if people can't get their money out, um, I mean, it's, it's frightening. And that's what's been happening here. So you, you do have this dichotomy where people are trying to get on with their lives, and then at the same time they can't. And, it, and when you look at that map, I mean, it is very instructive. You look at how far away I am, closer to Poland than to the capital. It is a different story here. I mean, there is no question that people, I think, feel that that, that war is far away. And when we talk about these reservists, we need to remind our viewers, this is a war that has been going on for seven, eight years here. So the, for the people who live in the western part of this country, you know, most of them speak Polish, we're, we're close to the border, that war is geographically and, and it feels just farther away. I should also note, by the way, we just got a note from the French Foreign Ministry, not surprising that France is calling for all French nationals to leave Ukraine and to stay as far away from the border areas in the north and east of Ukraine as possible. We showed you on the map that that is where a number of Russian troops are amassing. Before I have to let you go, Cal, what is the read from Ukraine, as far as you can tell, of how they feel about what Western nations are doing? The sanctions that have been imposed, the threat of more sanctions, the decertification of Nord Stream 2 by Germany. Its Chancellor Olaf Scholz mentioned that a few days ago. How's that playing on the ground in Ukraine? I think people will take whatever they can to stop an invasion. I mean, whatever it takes, if you're Ukrainian, um, is an acceptable answer on sanctions. I mean, the Nord Stream 2 um, deal is huge. It's, it's huge. I mean, energy prices are going to go up across Europe. So there is a sacrifice that is being made by some of these governments. A lot of these governments are in a tough spot. Germany certainly is in a difficult position. But for the people here, I mean, 150,000 troops amassed along the border. And the talk, again, is starting to align. You know, what Washington has said is starting to come true. And one of the themes is it doesn't take 150,000 troops to secure an area that is already a separatist controlled area. Um, the fear is definitely ratcheting up. So any sanctions that can be brought on, and I think there was an understanding here, too, by the way, that it was that first round of sanctions, not the full sanctions and a hope that Vladimir Putin would stop the troops where they are. Certainly that's the hope in places like Kiev and, and places like where I am, Joshua. Thank you, Cal. Much appreciated. That's NBC foreign correspondent Cal Perry reporting for us tonight from Lviv near the border with Poland. Now let's bring back NBC News analyst Michael McFaul, former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Ambassador McFaul, let me start with what Secretary of State Antony Blinken said earlier tonight to Lester Holt. Here is part of their interview from Nightly News. Watch. Do you have reason to believe that before this night is over, Russian f forces will be engaged in something akin to a full invasion of Ukraine? Uh, I do. Unfortunately, Russia has positioned its forces uh, at the final uh, point of readiness across uh, Ukraine's borders, to the north, to the east, uh, to the south. Everything seems to be in place uh, for Russia to engage in a major aggression against Ukraine. I just want to be clear about the framing of Lester's question. He was asking, basically, do you think Russia is going to invade tonight? And the Secretary of State said, we cannot rule, basically, we can't rule it out. That's, that, that's huge. It's very scary. It's very sad. Whether it's tonight or tomorrow night, there, there are no indications that it won't be happening eminently. And this is going to be a tragic day in the, the history of Ukraine, the history of Russia, the history of Europe, the history of the world. We're on the verge of a major cataclysmic, horrific war, I think the likes of which we haven't seen in Europe since 1939. Ukraine called for an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council. That's going to happen at 930 Eastern time, uh, basically in about an hour and 15 minutes from the time you and I are talking. Give me a sense of what may happen at that meeting, what impact it might have, whether there is any impact to be had at that meeting to prevent an invasion, another invasion from happening. Well, just to remind everybody, the UN Security Council has five permanent members uh, and they can veto, They in, in individually, they can veto any resolution. Uh, Russia has one of those vetoes. 
So there will be no action from the UN Security Council to stop this war. I think it's an important symbolic thing. The United Nations Security Council is supposed to be the body that tries to prevent wars. That's why it was set up in 1945. It was set up after World War II, after we had annexation like we're having now, after we had unprovoked attack uh, by Germany and the Soviet Union in, in 1939 to start that war in Europe and also in, in Asia with Japan attacking unprovoked uh, China. Uh, this is what the whole system was set up to prevent. And now we're on the verge of that system breaking down. Uh, I think in a major way. This is this is much bigger than just Ukraine. I want to make sure people understand this, Joshua. We we had that horrific war in World War II, um, and our leaders got together after it and said we don't want those kinds of wars. So we put in place norms, rules, treaties, the UN Security Council to prevent annexation, to prevent unprovoked wars like we're about to see. Uh, this is a new era in the history of the international system that tragically could begin as soon as hours from now, but most certainly seemed like it'll uh, begin in the coming days. To that point, we heard from Ukraine's foreign minister at the UN General Assembly. We played a piece of that earlier, but he also sort of echoed the point that you just made. Here's another clip of Ukraine's foreign minister. Watch. Russia will not stop at Ukraine. If a permanent member of the UN Security Council succeeds in breaking literally all rules, other actors will be inspired by him and follow his pattern. So if that is the case, let me get your sense of the sanctions. We just heard about new sanctions from President Biden today. We heard from CNBC's Robert Frank at the top of the hour that Russia has spent the years since 2014 building up financial buffers despite the sanctions, presumably in case it went through something like this again, what is your sense of how far that could last him? I mean, how long could Vladimir Putin presumably hold out if the West decided to really clamp down economically? It's a hard question to answer because Russia is a large economy, you know, depending on how you count, sixth, seventh, eighth, uh, ninth in, uh, in the world. They have a lot of resources that they can sell. And these are global markets, right? Oil and gas markets are global. Uh, we can't have sanctions to prevent them from selling that, uh, and that countries like China will continue to buy it. So I think we shouldn't have any illusions, no matter how dramatic the sanctions are, and by all accounts, they will be the most dramatic, comprehensive economic sanctions ever uh, levied against Russia and maybe ever levied against any country ever. Uh, I think that's happening, and yet it won't stop and it won't affect Putin's decision-making. And for it to have a long-term effect on the Russian people so that they have the courage to uh, revolt, I think that's a, you measure that in years, not in months. And everybody needs to remember, you know, last year was the most repressive crackdown in post-Soviet Russian history. Uh, Mr. Putin arrested the chief opposition leader, Mr. Navalny. He cracked down on even very small pieces of the media. He chased away, many people are in exile, some of them living here next to me in Palo Alto. Uh, he didn't do that. that, that wasn't by accident. He did that first before this action uh, because he doesn't want to have resistance. He doesn't want to have protest happening against him. The other day there was, there was a, a, a protest against war, but it was only six people because it's very dangerous to protest in Putin's Russia today. We have to pause in a minute, and we'll continue on the other side of the break, but I did want to ask you about a piece you wrote earlier this month referring to something called the Budapest Memorandum. You wrote, quote, the 1994 Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances for Ukraine sent Kyiv's nuclear weapons to Russia in exchange for promises that Moscow, the United Kingdom, and the United States would respect Ukraine's territorial integrity, unquote. That's from your article from Foreign Affairs magazine. Before we pause, Ambassador, talk about what that tells you in terms of Ukraine's position. I mean, if Ukraine still had its nuclear weapons and it never signed this memorandum, it'd be a very different country right now, one that might have a very different, let's say, governmental structure and a different outlook than it does right now. But it gave up those weapons, charted a new path, how do you see kind of the confluence of those things? Well, you know, I just listened to Mr. President Zelensky's speech to the nation tonight, and it was incredibly emotional, incredibly powerful. The first part was aimed at Ukrainians, but then the second part, uh, he was speaking Russian. Uh, 
Uh, by the way, Zelensky's native tongue is Russian, just so people know. He's from the East. And so when people say he's a Nazi and he's against Russia, it's complete nonsense. And he made, he made that appeal tonight, and he talked about that. How, why would I want to bomb the cities that I grew up in and where my friends live, where my grandmother's friend was buried, et cetera? But he mentioned the, this Budapest memorandum uh, in that speech because Ukrainians feel cheated. Uh, they were told by the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia, you give up our nuclear weapons, and we, you are going to guarantee our sovereignty. And here we are two decades later, and we, they have been cheated. Uh, and I, he, he, he basically said, so now we're on our own. Uh, we were cheated by Russia. They're invading. And the powers that said they were going to help us are not with us. We're, we're, we're going to have to battle them alone. If you're just tuning in, we're speaking to Ambassador Michael McFall, NBC News analyst, former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Stick around if you would, please. We've got more to discuss with you after the break because we've been talking through the possibility of war on the ground in Ukraine. Still to come, we will shift to an attack that's already begun online. A number of Ukrainian banks and government websites were knocked offline today. What are cybersecurity officials saying about that? And how is the White House responding? We're glad you're with us for now tonight from NBC News. Ukraine could soon be under another physical attack, but Ukrainian websites are already under a wave of cyber attacks for the second time in recent days. The head of Ukraine's Ministry of Digital Transformation said a number of sites were forced offline today, among them the National Parliament and Cabinet of Ministers. Hackers also targeted a number of banks. Now, we don't know the scope of the damage or the exact source. Both the Ukrainian and U.S. governments blame Russia for similar cyber attacks in the past. Russia has denied causing these recent attacks. But as Ukraine's top security advisor puts it, quote, the number one task for Russia is to undermine us from inside, unquote. From our partners at Sky News, security and defense editor Deborah Haynes reports from Kyiv. The Ukrainian president's top security official has a strong suspicion who's behind a massive cyber attack on his country. And he says it could signal a new physical assault will follow. So you believe Russia was behind this attack? With a warning to Ukrainians to be afraid and expect the worst, the cyber attack began at about 2 a.m. local time and hit around 70 government websites. The foreign ministry among those affected. Oleksiy Danilov reveals that some defense and security sections within government have since been put on an even higher state of alert in case of further hostilities. Do you think this cyber attack is um, a first shot that will that is coming before an actual physical military attack? Якщо дивитися по підручникам, то так і є. Дестабілізація, 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 потім активізація. Do you really believe that there is a chance that new military action from Russia against Ukraine could come as early as tomorrow? Russian snipers pictured training close to Ukraine's eastern border this week. Even though President Vladimir Putin has denied he's planning a new invasion, He's also previously denied allegations of cyber attacks. At a key cybersecurity center in Kiev, they're taking no chances. Officials help to respond to the latest attacks. They register the cyber incident that happened uh, today, and uh, they exchange data and coordinate with other teams uh, uh, how to respond to this incident. While in other rooms, a training session is going on to bolster their defences for the next one. Everybody is doing its work. Our soldiers, these uh, uh, protecting our borders, and we here are protecting Ukrainian cyberspace. A reminder that in today's conflict, the front line is everywhere. Deborah Haynes, Sky News, Kiev.
NBC News analyst Michael McFall is back with us. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Ambassador, help me put this into some, some context because there are all kinds of players who could be behind this. It could be the Russian government, could be someone the Russian government is paying, could be some hacker who's trying to exploit the situation, like create, the, get in underneath the chaos for, for, for profit or for other political aims. Help us put this in some context in terms of how this connects to the situation we're watching on the ground. Well, uh, Mr. Putin's gone to war before, just to remind everybody. Um, and his first attack against a, a sovereign nation was in 2007. It was a cyber attack against Estonia. Uh, when he went into Georgia in 2008, they accompanied that attack with cyber attacks as well. And that happened again in 2014 when he invaded uh, Ukraine the first time and annexed Crimea. So I fully expect, and, and cyber experts fully expect, that cyber will be one of the spaces where this war will be fought. And it looks like it's already started, as, as was just reported. I suspect if they go in big, and they may even, as they were just talking about, that may even happen in the coming hours, uh, you will see massive cyber attacks as well against all kinds of different uh, uh, parts, uh, infrastructure, government, communications, uh, military installations. And the other thing I want to add, uh, there was an attack, Russia attacked uh, Ukraine in 2017. It was called the NotPetya cyber attack, uh, massive cyber attack, the biggest attack they'd ever done against Ukraine. But it's kind of hard to use these weapons in a precise way. Um, NotPetya actually bled uh, all over the world. Uh, because, you know, the cyber world, we're all connected, right, Joshua? We're connected all over the planet. And if they do launch a massive cyber attack, I worry about secondary and tertiary effects in other countries as well. You get to what I was just about to ask you about, those secondary and tertiary effects, because I, I, I understand the concern on the ground in Ukraine. I feel like if people don't really see how that touches us immediately here in the U.S., the potential for cyber attacks really concerns me. Because you're right, those are not tools that you can just say, I'm going to hit just that machine and nothing else. Some of those tools, you put them out in the web, and who knows where they end up stopping. Is this the kind of thing where if it bleeds over to Western nations, we're more sophisticated? We know how to deal with it if some of these attacks affect computers in the U.S., infrastructure in the U.K.? Like, how prepared are we to deal with this? So there's good news, bad news here. Uh, the good news is that we've been working with the Ukrainian government, that is the U.S. government, not me personally, but the U.S. government, our cybersecurity experts, to enhance their uh, cyber deterrence and their defenses, right? Resilience is the word that they use. And so they're in a stronger position today than they were in 2017. That's the good news. The bad news is that Russia has tremendous cyber capabilities, I think second only to the United States. Um, and we are a very open society. So, you know, people talk about what happens in offense, defense with Russia versus the United States. The first thing I would say is I think it will be, it will be highly unlikely that we would do anything in an offensive way against Russia should this war begin to unfold, probably if we need to start saying by now. But because we're such an open society and we're so connected to the world, including Ukraine, uh, I was on a Zoom call uh, <laughs> to Ukraine just two hours ago, talking to the Ukrainians, right? Um, uh, that makes us more vulnerable because we're so open. Um, and I suspect this is a part of a broader thing that I think people need to start thinking about. Um, on the verge of war, the day before war, which it feels like we are today, uh, leaders always promise a short little war, we'll be there, we'll be home by Christmas, it'll just be in this one country, it won't last forever. And we know tragically from history that one, wars go on a lot longer than leaders promise, and two, tragically, they sometimes bleed into other countries and cause uh, problems and security issues for other countries in unexpected ways. And when you have 190,000 soldiers on one side and 250,000 soldiers on the Ukrainian side, I think there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences that we're just we're not being creative enough to think about. I hope I'm wrong, uh, but I know from history this oftentimes happens.
I also think that you know, we, we should be clear. This is not a theoretical concern here in the U.S. We heard today from Phil Murphy, who is the governor of New Jersey, responding to these concerns about cyber attacks in Ukraine. Here's part of what Governor Murphy said. We are at a very heightened state of alert and defense on cyber. Um, and that includes not just state government and agencies, but also working with our private sector uh, players and obviously working with our federal uh, partners. Ambassador, this is a little bit further afield from Ukraine, but we've got these concerns about cyber attacks on Ukrainian government institutions, Ukrainian banks, these what are called DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service attacks. Basically, you flood a website with way more traffic than it can possibly handle, and the website freaks out and shuts down, a DDoS attack. We also know that Russia has been involved in misinformation and disinformation for years and years, both in Ukraine, in U.S. during our elections, and basically they've kind of never stopped. How much to do you day, think... Yes. To this day, right. How much do you think that the world is learning how to deal with these kinds of incursions by Russia, by non-state actors around the world? I mean, it, it feels like if what, happen, what happens on the ground in Ukraine feels remote because we don't share a border with Russia, this is where it touches everybody. Well, I think we've made progress. Uh, and most certainly the government has made progress. And there are private sector cybersecurity companies. You know, where I live here in the Silicon Valley, it's a booming industry. Uh, lots of my Stanford students go to work for these companies. Uh, but there's two problems. One, most of the cyber infrastructure is the private sector, as the governor just said. It's not the government it, that's in control of it. So there has to be cooperation between the National Security Agency, uh, Cyber Command, and the private sector. And that's complicated, right? It's, pr the, it's the, you know, if you think about like the military, uh, we don't we don't have the private sector doesn't own tanks uh, and run tanks that's owned by the government in this domain space most of the infrastructure is in the private sector not controlled by the federal government and second um there's something called cyber hygiene there are little things you got to do like dual authentication to make your your yourself safer here at stanford i can't get on to my system unless i sign up for dual authentication that's what my employer has decided we all have to do but hundreds of, you know, tens of millions of Americans don't do that. Uh, and you have to get people to willingly do things that are in their cyber hygiene interests. And think about the pandemic, how much trouble we've had getting people to do what's in their health interests. It's the same thing in the cyber world. And that means that there's a lot of vulnerabilities in our system today. Yeah, two things that I think more people can do in response to threats like this one from Russia on Ukraine. No reason we couldn't face that threat here. Two-factor authentication. Turn that on for Twitter, Facebook. Don't think your social media account's not important enough for someone in another country to hack. And password lockers. Dash pass, uh, dash lane, last pass to help store your passwords and change the passwords you've been using since 1997. Password should not be your password. NBC News analyst Michael McFaul, former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Appreciate you spending so much time with us tonight. Thank you very much. Sure. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Coming up, President Biden is getting closer to announcing his Supreme Court nominee. We'll see who's on the short list and hear how some of the Republican leadership is responding. Your headlines are just ahead. Stay close. Let's get into headlines with an update on President Biden's Supreme Court nominee. Sources tell NBC News the president has met with at least three potential candidates to succeed Justice Stephen Breyer. The nominees include two federal judges, Ketanji Brown Jackson and J. Michelle Childs. Also, California Supreme Court Justice Leandra Kruger. The White House says the president will make his announcement by Monday. He promised to do so before February was out. And as promised, the nominee will be a black woman. That decision has been met with mixed reactions on Capitol Hill, including a bit of apathy. President Reagan promised to put a woman on the Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor. President Trump promised to put a woman on the Supreme Court when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. So I'm not complaining about 
that, and I hope the president picks a highly qualified nominee. We don't have a nominee yet, but I guarantee you she will be respectfully vetted. Meanwhile, a federal jury has begun deliberating in the civil rights trial involving the murder of George Floyd. You recall that former officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty of murdering Mr. Floyd. Well, the other three officers who were there faced charges for allegedly depriving him of medical care. Two of the officers, Tu Tao and Alexander King, also faced charges for failing to intervene in Derek Chauvin's use of force. Prosecutors argue that the three officers violated their training by not helping George Floyd, essentially by not doing enough to prevent his death. The defense argued that they were inexperienced, had received inconsistent training, and deferred to Mr. Chauvin's seniority. He was a 19-year veteran of the Minneapolis PD. Officers King and Lane were both in their first week on the job as full officers. Derek Chauvin was convicted of murdering George Floyd back in April. He was sentenced to more than 22 years in prison. We may be learning more from Ivanka Trump about the January 6th insurrection. According to her spokesperson, she's in talks with the House committee that is investigating the attack. She's also discussing appearing voluntarily for an interview. Last month, the committee publicly released a letter it had sent her. Lawmakers wrote that they had evidence that she was in direct contact with former President Trump on January 6th while serving as one of his senior advisors. They also claimed that she may have direct knowledge of her father's effort to convince then-Vice President Mike Pence to overturn the election. As for the rioters themselves, one woman who live-streamed the attack was sentenced to prison today. Mariposa Castro will serve 45 days behind bars. She's one of more than 725 people who've been arrested for their involvement in the insurrection. Hey, a quick programming note. We're still looking for small business owners, specifically in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We're putting together a special group to join me in Dallas this Tuesday for reaction to President Biden's State of the Union address. Small business owners deal with all sorts of challenges every day, so we want to hear whether the address gives you confidence that the administration will help you meet those challenges. So, if you or someone you know would be good for our Tuesday night special in Dallas, please get in touch. We do not care what political party you are in. Could care less. We only care that you get in touch. So leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. You can hit us up on social media at NBC Now Tonight or email us now tonight at nbcnews.com. Up next, the CDC has new guidance for getting COVID vaccines. Health officials say some people should wait even longer between doses. We'll explain when we come back. As you know, the U.S. has three COVID vaccines to choose from, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. But another option could be on the way. Two drug makers, Sanofi and GlaxoSmithKline, are seeking FDA approval for their two-dose vaccine and booster. This vaccine trial got funding through Operation Warp Speed. It was expected to be ready last year, but the early trials showed it wasn't ready yet. Now, the human trials show it's 75% effective at preventing moderate to severe illness. Now, if you or a loved one are thinking about getting vaccinated, the CDC has new guidance on how long to wait between doses. It says most people 12 and older should wait up to eight weeks between doses instead of three to four weeks. This is for mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna. Studies have shown that waiting longer might reduce the risk of heart inflammation called myocarditis. That's especially for males between 12 and 39. Now, to be clear, myocarditis is vanishingly rare, even with the shorter wait time. We're talking about a few hundred cases per million at most. If you are planning on getting a vaccine, we can help. Head over to planyourvaccine.com where you can scan that QR code on your screen. Vaccinations continue to make a big difference in America's fight against COVID. In the last two weeks, cases have gone down 66%. Hospitalizations are down 44%. Deaths are down 24%. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. And Dr. Patel, let me start with this new vaccine. We've already got a surplus of vaccines. Um, about two-thirds of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated. So what's the need for yet another vaccine on the market? 
Yeah, Joshua, it wouldn't seem intuitive, right, that we have so many vaccines. What's one more going to add? This one's unique, however, because it is what we call a protein-based vaccine. So you just mentioned the mRNA vaccines, which is pretty much the only game in town. Let's be honest. You really walk into a pharmacy or a clinic, it's really Pfizer mostly or Moderna. You just don't see Johnson & Johnson even being offered. But what comes with this uh, new vaccine from GSK, and by the way, this is a joint venture, as you mentioned, between two very well-known vaccine manufacturers, Sanofi and GlaxoSmithKline. They've got experience doing this. It's really a kind of a traditional vaccine technology where they modify and kind of make a dummy version of the coronavirus to fool your body into thinking that it's being introduced to the coronavirus when it develops its immunity so that when the real thing hits, you've got the immunity you need. We think this could help with some people who still, Joshua, are just nervous and feel like the mRNA technology is, quote, too new, which we know it's not. But that is what's holding some small select group of the population back, and this could be another option. This new vaccine guidance from the CDC is aimed at reducing the risk of myocarditis. Can you put that into a little more context in terms of why they chose to update this guidance now? I mean, myocarditis, for all of the talk that it's gotten on a particular podcast in particular, is extremely extraordinarily rare. So how much concern is myocarditis in the scheme of things? Yeah, in the big picture, myocarditis from vaccines is trivial compared, Joshua, to myocarditis that we see from COVID infections itself. And I, I can't stress that enough. In fact, you are up to 60 times more likely if you're a young male to actually get myocarditis from a COVID infection compared to vaccines. Because as you mentioned, it's exceedingly rare to get it from a vaccine. Having said that, I think this is something that, that the CDC and the FDA deserve props for because the CDC looked at the data from other countries where, for example, in the UK and Canada, because of both vaccine availability as well as just the time they needed to give second doses, Joshua, they had a longer interval period than the three weeks that we used in the United States. So in effect, we got to watch kind of a natural experiment. And lo and behold, in other countries where they spaced the vaccines apart longer on average of eight weeks, there was a lower incidence of myocarditis. So if we can give people a good amount of immunity with vaccines, two doses, but we can prevent even these rare effects, that's the direction the CDC took. And that's why, again, you emphasize the right point. It's really for males aged 12 to 39 that I will put this into practice. For others, I will try to also follow the three weeks because we don't see any of that myocarditis signal in women or in older men. But it's something that everyone can consider when they're getting their shot. Let me get to a voicemail from a listener asking about some of the COVID restrictions, particularly for children. One of our viewers asked about masking rules for his two-year-old nephew who's here in New York State and had some concern about what he felt was kind of, at least in his view, a sort of a heavy-handed restriction at this point in the pandemic. Here is what Steve left in our inbox. My nephew, uh, Blake is in a mask all day. As you know, mothers uh, of two-year-olds, they're constantly sort of wiping the mouths, wiping the snot and the saliva from a two-year-old's face. Can you imagine the amount of gunk, saliva, snot inside of a mask that's put on a two-year-old for an entire day at daycare, mandated by the state? To me, this is state-sponsored, state-mandated abuse of a child. Steve, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Dr. Patel, what would you say to Steve? Yeah, so Steve, I think that you're bringing up an incredibly important point with Blake. A two-year-old does not, first of all, we don't have great masks that fit two-year-olds. And then to have a two-year-old in a mask all day, I would just say to take it into context, we know that two-year-olds, at least from the studies that have been done, not just in the United States, but from other countries, that they have not experienced significant cognitive effects or any signs of kind of mental or physical abuse in general. Having said that, in New York State, for example, no matter where you are in New York State, the numbers are coming down at such a precipitous amount that what I would encourage Steve to do for Blake's family is to actually approach the daycare and to try to understand when can we relax mask guidance? And more importantly, it's really critical that the adults around Blake are vaccinated, and that can have an incredibly important effect. And instead, maybe moving to where masks are optional, especially as cases, Joshua, as you pointing out, are coming down double digits on a daily basis. So I think that the more important question really is, 
when can these masks come off? And then when do they need to come back on and for what circumstances? And if you've got adults that are vaccinated and even the adults wearing masks because they are the ones more likely to spread COVID if they get infected, that can be enough of a bubble to keep Blake protected. Keep in mind, there might be kids in Blake's daycare though that can't mount, you know, and that, are, that have other chronic conditions or have family members that can't get vaccinated. So some people will want that safety. And that's important to give, again, as an option as cases come down. Very briefly, Dr. Patel, before we go, L.A. County lift, is lifting some of its masking indoor requirements for vaccinated people. Again, vaccinated people. What is your sense right. of whether or not we'll need booster shots in the future so that we can keep these masking requirements lifted once we lift them? Briefly. I do, yeah, briefly, I do think we'll need them. The evidence is pointing to the booster being a critical factor in keeping people out of the hospital and some of the disease outcomes that we really care about, Joshua, including long COVID. So I do hope that the CDC updates that guidance or at least takes into account that natural infection combined with vaccine-induced immunity can also count. That's something that we haven't been able to do. It's nuanced, but we've had so many people infected that we probably need to take a more holistic approach as to what constitutes a booster. But it does need to be done, and it hopefully will get updated before the next surge. Dr. Kapita Patel, always good talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Last night, we asked you how paying the rent is going these days. Are you making it work, or are you making some changes? We'll share some of your stories before we go. Last night's conversation about rising real estate prices really resonated with some of you. We got a lot of very thoughtful responses. Thank you so much for these. Please keep them coming. Some of you said that your homes could be on the line if rent keeps rising. Tira from California writes, it saddens me that I cannot afford the neighborhood I grew up in. In fact, South San Jose used to be the cheapest area to live back in the early 2000s. Now the small four bedroom homes that were built in the 1960s go for just under a million dollars. I never thought I would decide to leave California. However, the continued increase in housing prices has left me no choice. Tira, as a former Californian, I can totally relate. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And of course, it's not just a home buyer's problem. Realtor.com points out that median rents in January rose nearly 20% from last year. Last month was the eighth month in a row that renters saw double-digit increases. Barry from Washington State says he can relate. Here's what Barry left in our inbox. In my opinion, a big share of that is because these rich, filthy rich landlords are getting too greedy, and they're just raising their rent to the roof. My rent here, where I'm at in Chester and Washington, my rental space, tiny space to park my own 35-year-old motorhome, went up 40% in the last two years. It's the greedy landlords. 40% in two years. Wow. Barry, thank you very much. Now, these rising rents also threaten to leave more people homeless. Elisa told us about a friend who helped her out during the pandemic. Elisa writes, I've exhausted all available options to a single woman without children, which is zero. Arizona's low-income housing programs are only available to a minimum of two people. You have to have a space to work, internet, car, all these modern conditions in order to even hold a job in the first place. So it makes no sense to me how, the world, how in the world the answer is always to get a job or apply for assistance or call family or friends for help. If things remain unchanged and continue to deteriorate at this rate, it is only a matter of time before I am homeless again, perhaps this time forever. For now, I continue to work hard, be smart, and pray for a miracle. We are praying with you, Elisa, for a miracle. So honored that you shared your story with us. Thank you so much to everyone who shared their stories with us. And listen, we want to keep this conversation going. If only you could sit in on our morning editorial calls with the producers. As we kick this around, we are dying to keep talking about the cost of housing. So if you want to share your housing story, we are all ears. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can reach out to us directly by voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622 or email us now tonight at nbcnews.com. 
We're very proud of tomorrow's show. Please do set a reminder, set yourself a reminder, set the DVR for Black History Now. That premieres at 8 p.m. Eastern right at this time, right here on NBC News Now. We hope you'll join us for our special, but until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you for making time for us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.